Some suggest that the Palestinian people were offered and rejected deals that could have ended the occupation. And, therefore, Israel can maintain it pending a settlement. Even assuming, arguendo, the veracity of this account, the deals involved a further loss of the sovereign territory of the Palestinian people. Israel cannot lawfully demand concessions on Palestinian rights as the price for ending its impediment to Palestinian freedom. This would mean Israel using force to coerce the Palestinian people to give up some of their peremptory legal rights, illegal in the law on the use of force, and necessarily voiding the relevant terms of any agreement reached. The Palestinian people are legally entitled to reject a further loss of land over which they have an exclusive legal peremptory right. Any such rejection makes no difference to Israel's immediate legal obligation to end the occupation. Turning to the law on the use of force, Israel's control over the Palestinian territory since 67 as a military occupation is an ongoing use of force. As such, its existential legality is determined by the law on the use of force as a general matter beyond the specific issue of annexation. Israel captured the Gaza Strip and West Bank from Egypt and Jordan in the war it launched against them and Syria. It claimed to be acting in self-defense, anticipating a non-immediately imminent attack. The war was over after six days. Peace treaties between Israel and Egypt and Jordan were subsequently adopted. Despite this, Israel maintained control of the territory, continuing the use of force enabling its capture. Israel's 67 war was illegal in the Yossad Bellum, even assuming, arguendo, its claim of a feared attack. States can't lawfully use force in non-immediately imminent anticipatory self-defense. Alternatively, assuming, again arguendo, that the war was lawful, the justification ended after six days. However, the Yos Ad Bellum requirements continued to apply to the occupation as itself a continuing use of force. In 1967, with self-determination well established in international law, states could not lawfully use force to retain control over a self-determination unit captured in war unless the legal test justifying the initial use of force also justified on the same basis the use of force in retaining control. Moreover, this justification would need to continue not only in the immediate aftermath, but for more than half a century. Manifestly, this legal test has not been met. Israel's exercise of control over the Gaza Strip and West Bank through the use of force has been illegal in the Yos Ad Bellum since the capture of the territory, or at least very soon after, afterwards. The occupation is, therefore, again, existentially illegal in the law on the use of force and aggression, this time as a general matter, beyond illegality specific to annexation. To terminate this serious violation, the occupation must, likewise, end immediately. What of Israel's current military action in Gaza? This is not a war that began in October 2023. It's a drastic scaling up of the force exercised there and in the West Bank on a continual basis since 67. 
A justification for a new phase in an ongoing illegal use of force cannot be constructed solely out of the consequences of violent resistance to that illegal use of force. Otherwise, an illegal use of force would be rendered lawful because those subject to it violently resisted. Circular logic with a perverse outcome. More generally, Israel cannot lawfully use force to control the Palestinian territory for security purposes pending an agreement providing security guarantees. States can only lawfully use force outside their borders in extremely narrow circumstances. Beyond that, they must address, they must address security concerns non-forcibly. The USA, UK, and Zambia suggested here that there is a sui generis applicable legal framework, an Israeli-Palestinian lex specialis. This somehow supersedes the rules of international law determining whether the occupation is existentially lawful. Instead, we have a new rule justifying the occupation until there is a peace agreement meeting Israeli security needs. This is the law as these states would like it to be, not the law as it is. It has no basis in Resolution 242, Oslo, or any other resolutions or agreements. Actually, you are being invited to do away with the very operation of some of the fundamental peremptory rules of international law itself. As a result, the matters these rules conceive as rights vested in the Palestinian people would be realized only if agreement is reached and only on the basis of such agreement. At best, if there is an agreement, this means one that need not be compatible with Palestinian peremptory legal rights, determined only by the acute power imbalance in Israel's favor. At worst, if there is no agreement, this means that the indefinite continuation of Israeli rule over the Palestinian people in the OPT on the basis of racist supremacy and a claim to sovereignty would be lawful. This is an affront to the international rule of law, to the UN Charter imperative to settle disputes in conformity with international law, and to your judicial function as guardians of the international legal system. A final potential basis sometimes invoked to justify continuing the occupation should be addressed. Occupation and human rights law, applicable to illegal and lawful occupations alike, oblige Israel to address security threats in occupied territory. However, they only regulate the conduct of an occupation when it exists. They don't also provide a legal basis for that existence itself. Existential legality is determined by the law of self-determination and the yos ad bellum only. There is no backdoor legal basis for Israel to maintain the occupation through the imperatives of occupation and human rights law. In sum, the occupation of the Palestinian Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem, is existentially illegal on two mutually reinforcing bases. First, the law on the use of force. Here the occupation is illegal, both as a use of force without valid justification and because it's enabling an illegal purported annexation. As such, it is an aggression. Second, the law of self-determination. Here, it's illegal again because of the association with illegal purported annexation, 
and also more generally because it is quite simply an exercise of authority over the Palestinian people that by its very nature violates their right to freedom. This multifaceted existential illegality involving serious violations of peremptory norms has two key consequences. First, the occupation must end. Israel must renounce its claim to sovereignty over the Palestinian territory. All settlers must be removed immediately. This is required to end the illegality to discharge the positive obligation to enable immediate Palestinian self-administration, and because Israel lacks any legal entitlement to exercise authority. Second, in the absence of the occupation ending, necessarily everything Israel does in the Palestinian territory lacks a valid international legal basis and is, therefore, subject to the Namibia exception, invalid. Not only those things violating the law regulating the conduct of the occupation. Those norms entitle and require Israel to do certain things. But this doesn't alter the more fundamental position from the law on the use of force and self-determination that Israel lacks any valid authority to do anything. And whatever it does is illegal, even if compliant with or pursuant to the conduct regulatory rules. I will close by quoting Palestinian academic and poet Rifat al from his final poem posted 36 days before he was killed by Israel in Gaza on the 6th of December, 2023. If I must die, you must live to tell my story. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a story. Thank you for your attention.